What is going on, everybody? Welcome into the reveal of our number seven team in my 2021 NFL Power Rankings as we are going to take a deep dive into the San Francisco 49ers. Before we get started, a quick reminder to please do hit that like button down below. It really does help support the channel. Also, if you enjoy, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you do not miss an upload as we continue counting down to number one here. Lastly, a reminder that TFG merch is available if you want to rep the brand and support the channel in the process. Uh, the link to my store is in the description below. I kid you not, this sweatshirt is super comfy, like let alone that it looks good and has the logo on there. Uh, my fiance has to tell me to take this thing off like three days a week because I choose it over all of my other sweatshirts that includes, you know, name brand stuff. And this, you know, only $40 great deal, let alone the fact that it's TFG merch. So uh, go check that out if you would like. And let's get into the 49ers here. And this is going to be a revenge season for Kyle Shanahan, not against other players, coaches, or teams, but against the injury gods. As last year, this team was known as the San Francisco 49 IRs. And surely you can make injury excuses for every team, but the Niners really had a historic run of injuries last year to their best, most important players, to the point where the only thing that could really explain what happened here last year was them signing Jason Verrett. He made some sort of deal with the devil where he was going to steal the lifeblood of the team so that he could stay healthy for the first time, but it was going to cost the rest of the team their entire health. I mean, it was insane what happened here on both sides of the ball. Offensively, they lose their center right out the gate. Uh, the skill players were in and out of the lineup all season. Ayuk, Debo, Kittle, Raheem Mostert. Uh, and then, of course, Jimmy Garoppolo goes down for the second half of the season. It, it was a rough run on the offensive side of the ball. But then on defense, they lose D Ford and Nick Bosa the year that they just let DeForest Buckner go or traded him away because they felt like they had enough pass rushers and they compound injuries at edge and really lose their best player on defense in Nick Bosa in what, the second game of the season? Uh, so it was pretty much a scrap heap team last year. This was not the same team that we saw take the league by storm in 2019 and win the NFC. And I do think this team is much closer to that 2019 team than the team we saw last year which is really why they come in here at number seven. There's a lot of exciting things here in San Francisco, and part of that was a pretty cool offseason that this team accomplished. John Lynch continues to uh, really solidify himself as one of the top general managers in the league, working there with Kyle Shanahan. Of course, they have that perfect dream vision for this team. They, they're in sync with what they want. So let's review this team's offseason, and then we'll get into the roster breakdown, ranking each position group, how they stack up against the rest of the league, and then we'll get into the schedule, talk a little bit of Vegas over under as we do in this series. But the key departures and additions, I really liked this team's offseason. This was another team that kind of um, supplemented all of their losses for the most part. Now, they do lose Robert Sala and Mike LaFleur, who is going to head over to be the offensive coordinator for the Jets. Sala, obviously, the new head coach for the Jets. And that's really the most significant loss here. I do like the D'Amico Ryans uh, hiring uh, at defensive coordinator here for this team. But Robert Sala is you know, one of the best leaders uh, among coaches in the NFL and, and good schematically as well. So that's probably the biggest question mark, at least on the defensive side of the ball as Kyle Shanahan really is, is more focused on what's going on on offense. I will say they do still have Mike McDaniel in place, who was uh, kind of at, at worst at the same level as Mike LaFleur. So it's not a huge loss there, but I do think worth noting, I think Mike LaFleur is an ascending young mind that uh, is no longer in the building. As far as the personnel goes, Kendrick Bourne, their third receiver, won't be missed too much, but they are going to need someone to fill into that role. Kerry Hyder. Uh, stepped up due to the injuries at edge that we mentioned, but they're not going to miss him. Richard Sherman really was a shell of himself last year, though in 2019 was still kind of his old self. So that's notable. And then Akello Witherspoon actually looked pretty good down the stretch last season as that defense came on. So the cornerback situation being sort of the one spot that they didn't truly replace their losses as we take a look now at the key additions. 
The quarterback room is being massively improved last uh, from last year. Jimmy Garoppolo comes back from health and uh, missed the second half of last season. And then they draft Trey Lance in the first round, trading multiple first round picks to go up and get their future star quarterback. They draft Trey Sermon, who will be in the mix at running back. And then getting some of those playmakers back, George Kittle, Debo Samuel back from injury. Uh, both guys were kind of in and out of the lineup last year. We're not very reliable for them as far as being on the field. Alex Mack is being signed at center as Richburg is going to retire here. And then on the defensive side of the ball, making some nice additions as well in Zach Kerr, who is an extremely underrated run defending nose tackle. They uh, get in line uh, for the next team to steal talent from the Raiders and pluck Maurice Hurst after he was released. And then D. Ford comes back after missing all of last season. They even signed a couple of nice linebackers there. Samson, Abuka, more of that edge hybrid style. And they just recently picked up Michael Kendricks. So an actually very busy offseason for the Niners, despite being pushed up against the cap a little bit. And in an offseason where they gave Fred Warner and Trent Williams the highest paid contracts at their respective positions, it was a busy offseason for the Niners, but to have a net positive offseason like this was really impressive work yet again by John Lynch. But let's go ahead and get into the roster now, and we're going to start with the quarterback grade. And this is a, a really complex situation here because there's a lot of people out there right now that think Trey Lance will and should be the week one starter, that he's got all of this potential and you traded all those picks to go up and get them. Why wait around? Let's put them in there. You see the explosive plays in training camp and in the preseason and uh, the excitement is off the walls for Trey Lance. And look, I get it. And even myself, I said on draft night that Trey Lance has the best chance of having a Hall of Fame career out of any of these rookie quarterbacks because it is a true perfect pairing of talent, scheme fit, and coaching it, with Kyle Shanahan here, who I think the world of but I also don't think it's that simple. Now, I'm not going to fault anybody for saying Trey Lance should start or that he could ball out as a rookie because I agree, that's definitely in the realms of possibility. Uh, but there's a lot more going on here, and I really don't think it's that simple. For one, you know, I, I really don't think Jimmy Garoppolo is as bad as everyone is making it out to seem. You know, sure, he has his limitations very clearly. He's not a great deep ball passer. He struggles to see linebackers over the middle of the field. He doesn't have high-end athleticism to extend plays with his feet. And the, the elephant in the room is the injury situation that, in my opinion, was the kind of straw that broke the camel's back uh, that uh, kind of had them move up and get a quarterback with obviously more upside, but just get someone that maybe isn't so fragile. Because <laughs> honestly, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo, what, has he finished one full season in his whole career? So that's a huge factor here. Uh, but when he's healthy, and he currently is, and all reports are that he looks better than he ever has, Jimmy Garoppolo's a top 20 or so quarterback. I don't understand all of the hate Jimmy Garoppolo gets. You know, I, I get it. He's similar to, say, Kirk Cousins, where he doesn't have all these amazing physical traits. The high-end play just isn't there. And I understand that the injury stuff is very frustrating. But when he's on the field and when he's healthy, and again, he is right now, he's a lot closer to Kirk Cousins and Derek Carr, and I would even go as far as saying Ryan Tannehill, but not going to say that too loud. Um, you know, he's a lot closer to those players than, you know, the players that people act like Jimmy Garoppolo is in the same group as. Guys like Tyrod Taylor, Case Keenum, Teddy Bridgewater. Like, I've heard people say no one should trade a fourth round pick for Jimmy, that he is a true backup caliber player. And it's just not true. To me, Jimmy Garoppolo has a good processor. He makes relatively good decisions to most starters in the league. Middle of the field, he can, you know, have some iffiness in there for sure. I think his pocket presence is pretty good. He's got some good poise in the pocket. He's tough. He's accurate in the short to intermediate game. He's relatively mobile. Um, you know, I, I think he is the definition of a, a quality starter, the definition of a quarterback that you can win with, but not a quarterback you're going to win because of. This is very similar to the Rams with Jared Goff. They wanted to move on. They wanted a quarterback with more arm talent, more upside, more mobility. Um, that's, that's what we're seeing here, but it's not like Jimmy Garoppolo straight up sucks. He's certainly one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the NFL, and I would say when healthy, he's in that 20 or so range. Uh, now, 
The team here is going to rank 19th. And I think the competition here breeds some of the best quarterback play that they've had here in San Francisco, if not the best, because I do believe in sort of lighting a fire under someone's butt in drafting a guy. We, we saw it most recently with Aaron Rodgers. Jordan Love comes in and Rodgers plays his best football. Jimmy's not capable of an Aaron Rodgers type of season, but he could certainly get back to what he was in 2019, and that would be around the 19th best quarterback in the NFL today. So that's one possible outcome. And then there's all of the outcomes that involve Trey Lance here. Um, so this is where it gets really complicated. Of course, there's the excitement with Trey Lance and wanting to see him play. I love Trey Lance. And again, I, I think he has the best chance of having a Hall of Fame career out of any of these rookie quarterbacks. But I'm also not going to shy away from saying that I think he is the least ready to play out of all five of the rookie quarterbacks coming in. He played one season as a freshman at the FCS level for the most dominant college football team at that level, if not the most, you know, second or third, but pretty sure they won the national championship. So, you know, the, the speed of the game is going to be an adjustment for them. I don't think he's ever played from behind. If he has, it was, you know, down by a touchdown in the first half. They were literally kicking everybody's butt. And he had more games in that full freshman season where he only had to throw 10 or fewer times as he did games where he had to throw 20 or more times. So there's never really been pressure on him. And if you just look at his tape alone, he wasn't dealing with great pass rushes, not just the players he had to elude and all of that, but his own line was kicking ass. So he had time to throw, his receivers were getting schemed open at a high level, and they didn't have to get off script because they're constantly just pounding people in the face. Now, there's a chance that that happens in San Francisco because it's the Niners, and that's what they did in 2019. Um, but I do think there is a lot to work with there with Trey Lance and, and a lot that needs to be worked with. I would also say that his throwing mechanics and deep ball accuracy was not at the same level as probably all four of the guys coming in. Maybe Mac Jones, you could debate, but um, you know, there's there's just a lot of development still to come for Trey Lance, and that's fine. But while a lot of people say he's got all this talent, just put him in there, you invested in this, look at the high-end plays, like think of the upside. Like, yes, I get it. I totally get it. I would actually go the other way on that a little bit, though, and say, yeah, you spent all of these first round picks. Think of the upside. Think of the future outlook here. Don't rush him out there when he is very likely going to have some bad tendencies as a 20-year-old rookie, given all the things I just described. We've seen countless quarterbacks come in and develop bad tendencies and, if nothing else, learn through trial and error, like a Josh Allen. Uh, which which would be could be fine, but that quarterback would not be better than the Jimmy Garoppolo that we could get here if he's healthy, if you know what I'm saying. So in my mind, it's better for Trey Lance and better for the team, frankly, if they play Jimmy now, they rest Trey Lance in the same way that Mahomes sat for a year, that Rodgers sat for a year, let him get up to speed, don't force him onto the field early, and give Jimmy that opportunity if he looks good, to, to go the distance and this is a team that two years ago was in the Super Bowl with Jimmy Garoppolo and this is not a team that you know their roster's good certainly but it's not like they have to win this year right it's not like oh they gotta throw Trey Lance in there or they're never gonna win a Super Bowl no like Shanahan's young Lance is young Nick Bosa's young they got plenty of time to get this thing done down the road so don't kind of uh, risk ruining your investment now that's not to say that you have to be super stubborn about it and you know, not monitor Trey Lance's development and see if he really does grow at a high level in practice. And maybe that is one of the outcomes here. And, and let's break down kind of the three ways that I think Trey Lance could get on the field here in 2021. Because I, I do think Jimmy Garoppolo is the week one starter. I feel very strong in saying that. Uh, you know, there's really three outcomes here that could get Trey Lance onto the field. Number one is the obvious one. Jimmy Garoppolo gets hurt. Um, Trey Lance is the backup. They just cut Josh Rosen. It's, it's going to be Lance as the backup. So if Jimmy Garoppolo, who's only finished one season healthy, goes down, you see Trey Lance. And maybe he never loses that job after that. 
Number two is Jimmy Garoppolo really does stink and he plays like a Case Keenum and they're losing games. Personally, I don't think that's going to be the case. We'll take a look at their schedule later on, but I'm relatively optimistic, uh, if not very optimistic, uh, about their outlook with Jimmy Garoppolo this year. And then the third option here is, in practice, Trey Lance just looks too good to not play him. And that's going to be really tough for Trey Lance getting limited reps, even in the preseason, where he's going to be starting a lot of these games. But at the end of the day, the Niners are getting better quarterback play in 2021 than they had last year with half a season of Jimmy Garoppolo and Nick Mullins. I mean, I think we get a better version of Jimmy G, if not the best version of Jimmy G that we've ever gotten. And then you have your insurance plan there in Trey Lance. It's surely a polarizing topic here, this Niners quarterback room. And I'm sure there's going to be Niners fans that think I'm drunk for saying Trey Lance isn't a first team all pro week one of the 2021 NFL season and surefire starter for this team. That's just not the way I look at it. It's not the way I think Kyle Shanahan and uh, uh, Lynch look at this thing. I think they are willing to be patient knowing what the future could look like and not wanting to risk that future. And I agree with that process. So 19th at quarterback for now, there's maybe a 2% chance that Trey Lance is just unbelievable as a rookie and they have top 10 quarterback play. It's in the realms of possibility, but I do think that's pretty unlikely. But let's go ahead now and move on to the running back room where they're going to rank 21st. Now, I have not a single doubt in my mind that this group here is going to outperform the 21st ranked group in the league, if that makes sense. This team does as good a job as anybody at scheming up gaps in the run game and just the the talent that they have from a run blocking perspective, not just the offensive line, but with Kittle and Juszczyk as well. You'll see the relevant fullback alert here with an elite fullback grade for Kyle Juszczyk. I have no idea how to factor in a a high-end fullback like that into the, the big picture of the league when there's only five teams out of 32 that have relevant fullbacks, but that's that's part of it here is they have excellent run blocking um, but the running backs themselves it's okay like I like Raheem Mostert he's the fastest running back in the entire league when he gets those wide open gaps and he hits top speed it's super fun uh, he also has some shiftiness and can run through arm tackles uh, but I would say outside of his speed, he doesn't have a truly elite skill set, um, but he's good. He's fine. He's going to have some huge runs, I'm sure. They sign Wayne Gallman, and Niners fans are probably going to be disappointed for me to have him above Trey Sermon. I don't feel great about that. I think Trey Sermon's probably a better runner, but Wayne Gallman was good enough last year for me to say that he probably comes into the season as, as the backup. Uh, until they can really fully trust Sermon. Uh, you know, Gallman is what he is. He's a backup running back, but he, he ran tough last year. He's a straight line dude uh, with some physicality. But Trey Sermon's the guy with the excitement here. He was a really good uh, running back prospect. He doesn't have great top speed, but he accelerates really well. And uh, he's so good at kind of breaking tackles in space and stiff arming dudes. It, he's kind of Kareem Hunt esque. Like when I watch him, it just reminds me of his running style. Uh, so it's an interesting scheme fit because he's not your typical like burning speedster. But once he gets going, he does kind of have that speed train style, if that makes sense. Uh, so I do like Trey Sermon, and I think he will be the the lead back at some point here in San Francisco, but. I don't know if that's going to be this year. Uh, and then you also have a bunch of dudes behind him that I kind of like. You know, you got Jeff Wilson, who's just been kind of a good third or fourth running back for them. Jamichael Hasty was one of my favorite undrafted pickups in the entire NFL last year. A very similar running style to Aaron Jones. Has the speed and explosiveness, short area shiftiness, great scheme fit. I, I, I hope he makes the team, but if he doesn't, I could see him ending up on another team that runs a system like this and him getting more opportunities and looking really good because they also draft Elijah Mitchell in the sixth round, which is almost too much talent to pass up that late. Another guy with speed and size. And honestly, if he became the best running back out of everybody here, I wouldn't be all that surprised. I don't know if that's a hot take or not, but he has a lot of physical talent and was a small school guy. Could have just slipped under the radar. Really fun player to watch. So that's got to be the six. I don't I don't see whatever Jay Hokit is making this team, uh, but it's a deep running back room. I think it's going to be very productive because everything in place here. But if you want to rank the guys just independent against the rest of the league, 
it's 21st. It's, it's nothing overly special here. And now the receiving room, which is yet another Shanahan style offense that has two really good options and then kind of a, a serious lack of depth, especially at the wide receiver position. Uh, but some interesting names that we're going to get through here uh, regardless, and they're going to rank 13th overall. And that's almost exclusively thanks to Debo, Ayuk, and George Kittle, which is, I would say, uh, God, it has to be the most explosive, most difficult to tackle group of playmakers in the league outside of maybe Tennessee, if you include Derrick Henry. Uh, but Debo Samuel is just a dream scheme fit because you know, he, he was never a high-end route runner coming out, but it was a guy that just, if you get him the football and you put him on a, a straight line route, his speed and his toughness is going to win out. And that's what we've seen with Debo. Now, you can actually make a pretty strong case that he should uh, you know, learn when to turn it down a little bit because I do think those injuries are starting to pile up because of his play style. You know, when you're not Derrick Henry, when you're not 225 pounds uh, and you're taking all these hits and you're seeking contact, those will start to add up. Uh, he's unique to most receivers in that way. Uh, so just a little note there, but when healthy, he is just a dream scheme fit. And then you have Brandon Ayuk, who's kind of the ascending guy behind him. A lot of Niners fans were upset that uh, when I did my wide receiver rankings, I said Ayuk doesn't have tier one alpha upside. And, you know, I'm not going to die on that hill. I, I really like what we saw from Brandon Ayuk. I was a little bit lower on him coming out. I didn't think the route running was top notch or anything, but he had a lot of similar traits to Debo Samuel. And when they drafted him, I said he was going to be really productive and look really good because they're going to be able to run what I call double Debo's here, which is just two guys running fast across the middle of the field uh, and nobody being able to keep up with these dudes uh, and excellent players after the catch as well. Ayuk at times even looked like a supercharged version of Debo Samuel. Now, if he continues to develop those routes and they uh, develop this, you know, kind of complex passing game here as Trey Lance's career goes on. You know, I'm not going to die on the hill that Brandon Ayuk can't get to the level of a Stephon Diggs or Devontae Adams. It, there's no physical traits there holding him back from doing that. I just think from a route running and release perspective, he still has a lot of work to go. Um, but that's an excellent duo there. And probably two more players that are going to outproduce my grades of them because of how well they get schemed up here. And then after that, you know, Richie James, just kind of a veteran slot option. Got He's got some shiftiness. He's fine. Mohamed Sanu is basically just here to block at this point. Uh, Trent Sherfield was the guy that had that explosive touchdown pass from Trey Lance. Uh, from what I can tell, he seems to be the wide receiver five here. He's been okay for the Cardinals. So I expect him to make the team. Travis Benjamin is just falling off a cliff if he was even on one to begin with, but he's got some speed. Jordan Matthews has definitely fallen off a cliff, but they are looking for that bigger bodied slot blocking type of dude. So between Sanu, Jordan Matthews, and Jalen Hurd, who fits that same profile, and even uh, Jennings down there, those guys are all kind of bigger, thicker slot receiver types. I can't imagine they keep more than two of them. Crawcraft probably not going to make the team as the slot guy. And then Austin Watkins, a guy definitely worth noting. I had a fifth round grade on Austin Watkins, and I was really surprised to see him go undrafted. And I love his scheme fit here as more of a true vertical option for this team. You know, it's not that Debo and Ayuk aren't good vertical threats, but they're even better in the intermediate game. And when you get into more 11 personnel, which isn't too often here, I don't see a guy here that has excellent vertical ability. You know, you got Sheffield and Benjamin there, uh, Benjamin there, whatever. Watkins has size, speed, release, and, and length to go attack the football downfield. I really liked what I saw from him. Now, he came out and ran a really slow 40 time that definitely didn't match his tape, but I would love to see him make this team because I think he has a great potential as just kind of a fourth option and a vertical threat in this offense. Uh, the tight ends here, obviously at the top of the league uh, with George Kittle, who is another player who plays extremely physical and that physical play style may be impeding his ability to stay on the field, but that's a little less avoidable for a tight end who's got to block all the time. You know, George Kittle, I think still is in the, the running for the best tight end in the NFL. The lack of health really is what uh, is the biggest case for Travis Kelsey over him. You know, Kelsey's a, a more refined as a route runner and, and maybe a better receiving option, but Kittle's not far behind him. 
and Kittle is still possibly the best blocking tight end in the NFL. So, I mean, he is obviously going to elevate this group. It's the biggest reason they rank 13th. Not that I don't like Debo and Ayuk, uh, but Kittle is that elite mismatch problem. Uh, really is, in a lot of ways, their number one wide receiver. He's at least kind of what they have in mind when they design this offense with the wide zones and the play action and the all the different ways they can scheme these tight ends open. So uh, expecting a big year for George Kittle and to get back kind of where he belongs into that t- no, number one tight end conversation. I, I threw a fullback on there, guys. Kyle Ustrick makes the list. I more so just wanted to mention the creative ways that he can be kind of a headache You know, it's not that he's some amazing receiver or anything, but for a fullback, he's certainly the best in the league and he can get open downfield and do some stuff after the catch. So it's more of a scheme thing with Kyle Juszczyk, uh, but they paid him for a reason. Like it's not, he's not just here to block. He does a lot as a receiving threat as well. Uh, And then you have the tight end depth. Ross Dwelly is okay. He's just kind of a jack of all trades, master of none type. Michael Pruitt was a sneaky little pickup for this team. He ran this system in Tennessee, but was in a crowded tight end room there with John U and Ferkser. And Pruitt played pretty well when he got his opportunities. He's in that same mold of, you know, maybe not quite John U. Smith, but like Irv Smith and Gerald Everett, these 6'2, 6'3 tight ends with really good speed uh, that in this system is kind of the flex tight end can leak out and get open up the seam. And that's, I think, what Pruitt's going to be here for. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him have a decent year and get on the field as kind of their Jordan Reed replacement, if you will. Charlie Warner is a really good blocker. At least he was at Georgia. So you really run four deep. And then Josh Perkins is just kind of an intriguing athlete that uh, will be fun to see what what he can do with Kyle Shannon getting his hands on, but probably not going to make the team there. Uh, Then the running backs, Raheem Mostert's fine. His short area juice Uh, and just kind of route running is is okay Uh, i would say you know he's a little bit of a long strider so his ability in that kind of short areas uh, it's it's just never going to be his biggest strong suit but he's got good hands and his ability to break one off in the screen game is of course exceptional he's the fastest running back in the nfl wayne gallman whatever do it all veteran that isn't great at anything. Trey Sermon being one of the more fascinating guys. I mentioned the Kareem Hunt comparisons, and that really showed up in the receiving game. Fluid ability to flip up field and has that natural ability to shake guys off in space. So I could see some uh, added third down work as the season goes on for Trey Sermon if his pass protection is up to snuff. Jeff Wilson's been solid when called upon, and Jamichael Hasty has a lot of upside there as well. So uh, they're, they're not uh, amazing receiving backs, but they'll get the job done. And that gives you your 13th ranked receiving group. And let's move on to the offensive line now where they rank eighth. Now, a lot of you have requested a run block, pass block splits, and I came really close to pulling the trigger on that for this, but I'm just going to finish out the series the way we've been doing it. And next year we'll get those splits. But the reason I bring that up is this team has the biggest gap between you know, pass blocking and run blocking. You look at these guys and I would say outside of Alex Mack, all of these guys are honestly significantly better run blockers than pass protectors. Now, Trent Williams at left tackle, that's only because he is the best run blocker in the NFL. (laughs) And his pass protection is just very good. But that gap is it's still there and notable and significant. Uh, You know, Trent Williams is in the debate for the best tackle in football. I think, you know, his run blocking is what sets him truly apart. And in this system, his ability to get on the move and just decimate players in space, it's so fun to watch. He is by far the most fun offensive lineman to watch in the league. Uh, so getting him back in here, they signed him to a you know six-year contract. I think it was technically seven, but if you look at the last year of that contract, he, he's not seeing that seventh year. I think it's like $33 million fully non-guaranteed he is not going to be playing that year on that cap hit um, but they wanted him to be the you know highest paid tackle or whatever ever so they threw that on there what whatever uh you're in love with having trent williams as your left tackle and then you got mike mcglinchey on the other side who's definitely a better run blocker than a pass blocker he is an elite run blocker and trent williams has surely helped him reach that level he has the athleticism the nastiness in space and the length to just kind of reach anybody he has the the speed like he consistently surprises me with how well he's able to climb to the second level 
but he has been held back from his pass protection in a traditional sense. He is a little bit lighter and his anchor is not very good and you will see him get overwhelmed. So that's part of something we'll, we'll continue to talk about as we go is there's aspects of this team where when they're in their script, when they're running wide zone and the run game's working and they're able to set up moving pockets off of the play action, which helps protect a guy like Mike McGlinchey not having to anchor in a traditional sense and have those real third down dropbacks on third and 11 where you know you got to run your your dig routes and set up deeper passing concepts that's when Mike McGlinchey you will see some weaknesses in his game Uh, but inside the structure of this offense he's about as good as it gets and then Lakin Tomlinson very similar thing he's just never been an ideal pass protector but an uber athletic guy that's why he was a first round pick he's tough and a scrappy physical run blocker Uh, So he's your left guard. Alex Mack can still play, but he's just not nearly what he used to be. That's got to be chalked up to age regression. And then Daniel Brunskill, another player who's not a pass protector. He's like 295 pounds. He can get overwhelmed. Wasn't particularly good as they had to kind of impulsively move him to center last year. Uh, But kicking out to guard, uh, he was actually at his best when he played tackle. But uber athletic guy in this system can run all of the wide zone stuff and execute those moving pockets. But again, in those traditional pass sets, you're going to see some weaknesses. So uh, that's why I I was really close to splitting those things up. But it is worth noting that they have some very significant strengths when it comes to move blocking uh, and scheme fit and athleticism and run blocking. When it comes to pass protecting in a traditional sense, maybe not so much outside of Trent Williams. Uh, The depth here, Justin School has played at a decent level for a a late round pick, but you don't want him starting. Tom Compton's an okay veteran to kind of rotate in there. I will note the Aaron Banks pick was interesting to me. I I will go against this pick. I I did not think he was worth anywhere close to a second round pick. And, you know, Lynch and these guys, they've earned the benefit of the doubt, but it's not like they've been perfect in the draft. And I just didn't see it with Aaron Banks, especially in this system. Like, he's not a great move blocker. Uh, he's just kind of a a big mauling type. Uh, Maybe they were way more impressed by his get-off and and run-blocking ability than I was. He's surely strong, and he's played at a high level at Notre Dame. Uh, But I don't know. That just seemed a little early for my taste, and we'll we'll find out. Hope he proves me wrong for sure. Uh, You got a couple of fifth-round picks there in McKivitz and Moore, kind of Probably both going to make the team there as some versatile players, but the depth is just normal O-line depth, nothing special. And that all cranks out the eighth-ranked offensive line ranking for these guys. They're going to be able to really help them do what they want to do schematically, as I mentioned, the wide zones, the moving pockets via play action, and that's all great. Uh, But it's also definitely worth noting that uh, if you really got into the splits here, these guys aren't the best pass-protecting group. One last little thing I should probably say there is that Mike McGlinchey is still young and has a lot of potential to get there. Uh, We just haven't seen it yet. So the offense as a whole is going to rank seventh here, and obviously they've got talent with the O-line and the receivers and some interesting quarterbacks here, but this is a lot to do about Kyle Shanahan, who I'm just going to say it, I do think is the most valuable head coach in the NFL, dare I say the best head coach in the NFL. You know, if I was doing a fantasy draft situation and I got to pick a coach, Shanahan would be my first choice. You know, maybe he's not the same on the leadership aspect as some other guys, but it's not like he's a notably bad, like, locker room coach. Like, they have a good culture here. He develops guys well. And when you watch them on tape, it just pops you in the face that Kyle Shanahan as an offensive coordinator, is just better than everybody else. He mixes things up every week. The pre-snap motion, painting a picture for the quarterback, scheming guys open, it's just at another level with Kyle Shanahan. And maybe I'm higher on him than I should be, but I just have so much confidence in this to look like a fluid offense run at the highest of levels around the league. And even if they have some holes here or there, I have confidence in Kyle Shanahan to get the most out of all of these guys uh, and earn some of that benefit of the doubt that we like to talk about on this series. Uh, So, you know, half the league is trying to do the Shanahan offense at this point, and it's not a coincidence. So 
Uh, they rank first with offensive coaching, and that is enough to elevate a good offensive roster up into the top 10, I would say. But now let's move on to the defensive side of the ball where there's honestly a lot more question marks because I feel very good about what Shanahan's going to do. We've seen him with these guys and assuming health, like feel pretty good about what we're going to see and the level at which we're going to see it. The defense, on the other hand, there's definitely some moving pieces here. Obviously, Robert Salah leaving. So how much does that carryover effect? How much does the scheme change and how much uh, you know, how good of a coordinator is D'Amico Ryan's going to be. I think it's all fascinating. But let's get into it. Starting with the run defense, where they're going to rank 13th, it's just a good run defense. I don't think it's a terrifying group or anything. Uh, but you start with the interior. Zach Kerr was a phenomenal signing. Uh, you know, this is the way I think you should invest in your nose tackle. There's guys like Zach Kerr to be found out there in the bargain bin every year. And it was the same case last year when the Panthers signed him, and he had, even then, his best year. I was really surprised uh, for the, the $2 million that they got him for, or $3 million, whatever it was. You know, in a league where Dalvin Tomlinson and Grover Stewart are getting, you know, $20, $30 million contracts, sign Zach Kerr for $3 million over that any day of the week, especially when you're a cap-strong team like the Niners. So excellent move by John Lynch to, to bring in a, a legitimate force on the inside because you don't really have that inside uh, presence and nose tackle other than him. You know, DJ Jones is actually probably the second best run defender here. He's been just okay, certainly not as good as Zach Kerr. And he'll be a part of this rotation, but I really think Javon Kinlaw is going to be put out there. And, you know, when they drafted him, he was not a great run defender that was just kind of part of his profile but you hope that he can be good enough as a pass rusher to compensate for his lack of discipline and play strength against the run and i think that they kind of live and die by that and hopefully surround him with enough pieces around him that it doesn't really make a difference which i think is what we see here if that makes sense uh, but they also were able to steal Maurice Hurst from the Raiders somehow. Just add him to the list of guys that somehow got out of the Raiders and they got nothing back in return for him. But um, a great pickup. He is a smaller guy and not a great run defender, but he does play tough and can make some splash plays. We'll talk more about Hurst as a pass rusher. Givens, kind of similar, smaller guy. Kentrell Street, same thing. He's really bad <laughs> against the run. Daniel's probably not going to make it. And then you get to the edge where you have certainly in the conversation for the best run defending edge duo in the league. We just had that with Cleveland as well with Garrett and Clowney. Uh, but this might be even better because you have Eric Armstead who literally got paid for his elite level dominance as an early down edge run defender. And then he slides a little bit further inside for pass rush. But then you got Nick Bosa on the other side, who's also a physical force who you bring back this year. He played with all of the effort and discipline that you could only ask of a premium three down edge defender. And he still was able to do that while uh, being one of, if not the best pass rushers in the NFL as a rookie. Uh, so again, one of the best edge defending run duos in the league. The depth there, you've got kind of an interesting, you know, motley crew of edge guys that they've kind of brought in here. D Ford's still there. He's going to have his role as the pass rushing specialist here, especially after coming off the injury last year. What he does in run defense almost doesn't matter for this team. Samson Abukum, kind of a D Ford backup in my opinion. Interesting signing. He's kind of a 3-4 outside linebacker type. I don't see him as a hand-in-the-dirt defensive end, but... That's probably what he's going to end up playing here is kind of that speed rusher. I, I don't know what he can do, but he's been a decent run defender for the Rams uh, in the last few years. Then you got some bigger body guys like Willis and Barrett and Yarbrough. They should be fine in a rotation. And Arden Key kind of more there with Ford and Abukum as uh, bendy, get-off speed rusher types. Uh, and then Calhoun's a guy with, with some run defending ability as well. Uh, so none of these guys are huge liabilities, uh, but just not great. And then you get to the linebackers. You got Fred Warners, uh, one of the better run defending linebackers in the league. He is a former safety, and if you want to really stack him up uh, as a, as far as his ability to stack and shed and thump like between the guards, which is getting very nitpicky, but if you want to stack him up against some other guys like a Bobby Wagner or Donta Hightower, that might be a knock on Fred Warner. That's uh, not really his game. He's much better in space than those players and he's longer than those guys he's 
You know, 6'3", he's got really good ability with his quickness to get off blocks in space. Uh, but, you know, thumping between the tackles, I wouldn't describe being Fred Warner's biggest strength, um, so to speak. But he's uh, obviously an asset to this run defense. And his ability to uh, run sideline to sideline, paired with Bosa and Armstead's ability on the edge, they're going to pair very well when you're going against the Rams in this division, the Seahawks in this division, the Packers in this conference, uh, the Vikings in this conference, all these guys running those wide zone offenses, these guys are built very well to handle the Shanahan offense, and they see it every day. So that's worth noting. Uh, and then you've got Greenlaw, who, you know, he's just he's a good player. There's not really much to say about him. I don't think he's ever going to be a great linebacker, kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none type. And then Michael Kendrick's coming in. Uh, probably going to be your third base linebacker there. If it's not him, you're going to get some kind of a safety... Uh, third safety, big nickel type with Jaquiski Tart. So we'll see We'll see what they want to do schematically there. Uh, but a good cover player, not much of a run defender, coming back after committing insider trading. Uh, they got Al Shair, really good backup. He's shown some nice things. Flowers Finnegan might be in that kind of big nickel conversation, part safety, part linebacker. And then Hilliard, really the only other guy I'm familiar with there with those linebackers, uh, kind of forced his way into that awesome rotation there for Ohio State. Uh, four of those guys are on NFL rosters right now, and Hilliard was kind of the odd man out, but showed a lot of juice, uh, forced his way onto the field really by the end of the you know the college playoffs and showed some good flashes. That could be a bit of a steal there, someone to keep an eye on. That's been a team that's been good at developing those guys. So it's a good front seven. Very good. Uh, you know, some squishiness on the inside, but overall it's a run defense that should probably help this defense more than hurt it. But then you get to the pass rush, and you know it's probably not going to be what it was in 2019, which was one of the top pass rushes of the last five years, but they do rank fifth for me. Uh, so you get Bosa back, and it's tough. You know He's almost in the same breath with like Derwin James, where he stepped onto the field, was just so incredibly dominant for a rookie, but then he got hurt, and you know we just haven't seen enough to quite put him in that same conversation with you know, Mack and Garrett and TJ Watt for the quote-unquote best edge rusher in the league. But I think I'm still higher on Nick Bosa than a lot of people. I don't think we're, I'm not going to say ever, but we're going to, it's going to be a long time before we see a pass rusher come in as a rookie and just be in their prime immediately. And I'm talking about physically speaking, Bosa was like fully maxed out as far as how jacked he was and how athletic he was. He looked like a 26, 27-year-old veteran in his prime. Uh, and on top of that, you get the tech, like the technical aspect. You know, you look at Chase Young or Miles Garrett coming into the league, you know, those guys might have better physical tools than Nick Bosa, though not, not by a landslide or anything. They're definitely faster and better get off, but, you know, Bosa is super athletic. But when you look at Bosa's technical uh, technician ability as a pass rusher the counter moves and just knowing what moves work for him it's it was unbelievable he entered the league as one of the most technically sound pass rushers in the nfl and it resulted in him being the most pa productive pass rusher in the league that year and honestly very well could have been defensive player of the year so you add that back you hope he's healthy you know there's some mounting injury concerns there, but I'm not to the point of being worried about it. And I really would bet on Nick Bosa getting into that conversation with Garrett and Mack and TJ Watt for the best edge player in the NFL. On the other side, you have D Ford, who's in the perfect role for him as that pass rushing specialist. He's not a run defender and he's a guy that's had a hard time staying healthy. So you put him out there probably in a similar wide nine defense where he's going out there as a nine technique where he can use that speed and and bend around the edge and really put a lot of pressure on the tackles to get out there and stop them from getting the corner. He's in a perfect role and scheme, assuming they stick with that wide nine. And after getting injured last year, again, not seeing him a lot of early downs, but a perfect role for him. And certainly this could be the best pass rush duo in the NFL this year. And then you have Eric Armstead, who I would again assume a lot of the wide nine stuff. You know, he's 6'7", 290 pounds. He's a hybrid player, 
but he will slide further inside on pass rushdowns. Now, he's not a true, like, you know, he's not the best when he gets closer to the guards. He, he often plays a lot of, like, four-eye or five technique, head up on the on the tackle in those wide nine defenses, but he can slide in further as well. We'll, we'll see how they use him. At the end of the day, though, his best pass rushing happens further, you know, inside the tackles. I would just say that, or head up. Uh, he's not a guy with speed and bend around the edge, but he has some power and physical tools and some quickness at his size that make him a decent pass rusher. Would I have paid him over to Forrest Buckner? No, absolutely not. They clearly paid him for his dominance as a run defender, but he's still a very good, I would say, number two interior guy. And that's when you look at Javon Kinlaw and say, dude, please figure it out because it was so rough as a rookie. Now, it was really rough for every rookie defensive tackle, but especially for Javon Kinlaw. I mean, he looked like Jerry Tillery, who is one of the bigger first-round busts of the last couple years as a 6'6", lighter defensive tackle whose power just didn't translate from college to the NFL. And you're terrified that that's the case with Kinlaw. Now, you need to see him stay healthy and continue to add muscle and really play with that get off and power that he showed at South Carolina. His range of outcomes at this point in time is still anywhere from Jerry Tillery to Chris Jones. So what do you get this year? He is the ultimate wild card for this defense. And I don't know. I I don't know how much I believe in him. I didn't put the green arrow next to him. I was really underwhelmed by Javon Kinlaw, but I did like him coming out. And I, I hope he, you know, well exceeds the 73 ranking, but even putting a 73 grade next to his name is well above what he gave this team last year, which was really low end uh, efficiency. So he is such a uh, pivot point for this defense. If they want to be a dominant, great pass rush and get back to 2019, where they were like one of the best defenses in the NFL, if not the best, if Kinlaw can't become a, a good interior rusher, their ceiling is going to be capped, I think, Uh, because it's a very good pass rush, obviously ranking fifth, uh, but I think this would need to be an elite unit for this to be uh, an elite defense. Uh, So they did sign Maurice Hurst, which I would just say increases the floor here, because if Javon Kinlaw, if you're sitting there week 11, week 12, and Kinlaw just ain't it, because I think they play Kinlaw a lot early and just kind of test him by uh, trial and error, Uh, But Maurice Hurst was just phenomenal value to basically get him off of the scrap heap. Uh, He's a good interior pass rusher. And I do think as we sit here today, their pass rush is better with Maurice Hurst out there uh, because he's quick and powerful and built like a brick house on the inside. And he's got good technique. He's been a good player for the Raiders. And that's saying something because he's, you know, he's been their best pass rusher. So we'll we'll see kind of where he comes in. Uh, how they use him, but to have him there is definitely an asset, and he increases the floor for this pass rush who just had Javon Kinlaw in there. Well, now you add Hurst in there. You also add Kerr, who's not bad. I mean, he was a better pass rusher last year than Javon Kinlaw, and he's got some power in there. Uh, Jones is really just a run defender, uh, and then Givens, maybe keep an eye on him to continue his development as a as a low-level pickup, but uh, yeah, this, this is really big for Javon Kinlaw to take a step up here in year two. The edge depth is also very interesting from a pass rush perspective. Samson Abukam was another cheap, good signing for this team. I, I see him as strictly a backup to D Ford, who has had injury problems throughout his career. Same thing with Arden Key. Both of these guys have great speed and get off off the edge. You don't necessarily want them starting, but in a specific role in a world where D Ford gets hurt, you can line them up wide and just say, run around the tackle. Both those guys have the ability to do that. Willis and Barrett and Yarbrough and Calhoun, more traditional, balanced guys. None of them really high upside, great players. So let's gloss over them, but they're all, you know, decent at a couple things here and there. Uh, But fifth for the pass rush. And definitely hoping Javon Kinla can st- take a step up and then they can get up towards that first ranked pass rush grade. But overall, this is going to be a unit that helps the rest of this defense. And I do think they get back to, uh, you know, forcing quarterbacks off, off rhythm and into confusion and forcing mistakes like they did in 2019. But now the linebacker grade, where they rank third, 
you know, Fred Warner, I think, is in a group of four with Eric Kendricks, Levante David, and Bobby Wagner for the best linebacker in the NFL. All those guys do a little bit different stuff. I think Fred Warner probably has the best balance of run defense, coverage, and uh, just IQ. I I love what you see from Fred Warner on a week-to-week basis. And the athleticism is is just phenomenal as well. Uh, So, you know, he does what those four linebackers do and what very few linebackers in the league do, covering players, not grass. He is so adept at identifying the first threat over the middle of the field and just don't just stand there. Don't just wave your arms. Go find the guy. Go cover him. Take him out. Force the quarterback off of what they're looking to do over the middle of the field. Uh, so that's a huge asset to have Fred Warner. He, he has the safety background there, and it shows. So, again, in the conversation for the best linebacker in the NFL, huge reason they rank third, but their depth's pretty good. You got Dre Greenlaw, who's a perfectly fine number two linebacker. He's made some really exciting plays, and he's a good player. Uh, it's really all I have to say about Dre Greenlaw. I'm not like uber excited about him, but I'm happy he's there. And then Michael Kendricks, another guy that was just a good addition. The depth here is bleh because you got Aziz Al Shair and really nobody else. So to get a veteran into this group with good coverage abilities uh, on a cheap contract, I think was a good move. Probably not going to play a ton here, uh, but it's good to have him in, in the case of injury. So they rank third for a linebacker. So you get really good coverage over the middle of the field and a high-end pass rush to start talking about some elite talent on this defense. Now, the coverage here, let's let's get into it. They rank 23rd in the secondary. I think I'm going to end up being a touch higher on this secondary than many people. I don't know where Niners fans are going to come in with this secondary. You'll have to let me know. But overall, there's just an overall lack of dominance in this secondary. I don't mind the depth necessarily. I don't know if they're going to have a ton of weak links out there, but there's no one that I point to and I'm like super excited about. So you got Jason Verrett would be the guy I get excited about because if he can stay healthy and continue to show that he's closer to what he used to be, then you're starting to talk about like a top 10 corner in the NFL. But this is a guy that got another cheap one-year deal because the league is freaking terrified of his injury record. This guy spent like five years being the butt end of everybody's jokes about injury-prone players. And I just made another one at the beginning of this video. So you hope he can stay healthy. I'd give him a 60% chance of playing every game. That's probably way too high, honestly. So, man, it's just a question mark. There's no way around it. But he's really nice when he's out there. Uh, Emmanuel Mosley is just kind of a low-end, number two corner, smart player, decent speed, undersized, uh, but I don't mind him. And the combination there tells me that, assuming they're starting, cover four is going to be the way to go. They liked cover four a lot last year, kind of that off-zone coverage. Both these guys very quick uh, and heady players. So it's it's not the worst cornerback duo in the NFL, and you have a very good slot corner in K1 Williams as, as well, who's quick and scrappy and kind of your typical quality slot corner. Um, but then after them, you've got some questions. Dante Johnson, a veteran who played okay for this team last year. Uh, I don't think you want him starting, but to have him as a fourth, to, who's a versatile guy, he's played some safety as well, it's fine. Ambry Thomas, I am excited about. Maybe not necessarily for this year. He was my number 11 corner in this class if you take out slot corners. Uh, and put them in a different group and a third round grade inside a class that I actually thought was pretty underrated these cornerbacks I love Ambry Thomas's press technique I love how he plays in phase he's comfortable with his back uh, turned to the quarterback and is really good in man coverage as well now if they're going with that quarters zone you know cover four coverage uh, heavy defense this year that's not necessarily Ambry Thomas's game he's more of a man to man corner so that's an interesting scheme fit but i think the talent was just a little bit too much for them to pass up so maybe you get him up to speed with how to play quarters coverage and he's quick like he's really quick with size he's got the physical ability to be a high-end uh quarters coverage defender as well and they like to go man coverage too so good there i suppose uh, but probably not going to see a ton from him this year but i wouldn't be stunned he's, he's a good prospect you got B.W. Webb is a good, versatile sixth corner to have, special team type. Uh, Diamador Lenore 
going to be very comfortable in these quarters coverages as well. Another pick that would tell me they want to stick with those quarters coverages uh, despite moving over to D'Amico Ryans. Uh, Lenore, very comfortable playing kind of that, you know, quarters off coverage, keeping your eye on the quarterback. He's got good short area quickness. Uh, I think makes this team as a decent backup, and that's probably uh, where he'll stay. Uh, and then let's move on to the safety group. It's a super high floor safety group, but again, I'm just not excited about any of these guys. Jimmy Ward is a very good free safety. Uh, he's a player with, I would just say, good, not great traits all across the board. He sees the game very well. He's a smart player. He's got ball skills. He can come up and tackle, uh, but just nothing that you point to and he's like, he's amazing at that, you know, but he's the best player in the secondary. And then you got your Quisky Tart probably is the number two safety contract year for him. I'm not a big Jaquiski Tart fan. I know Niners fans do like him. Kind of your typical strong safety, bigger dude. Now they could get a little more creative here, I think, and use Tart as more of that third linebacker, that big nickel role. And then you have kind of Clinton Dix and Tavon Wilson, who I think those guys are both better cover players than Jaquiski Tart, just not as good of a run defender as Tart. So we'll see how they decide to use these guys. Clearly, they want a lot of safeties on this defense because they've signed and drafted a bunch of them. Um, ha Ha Clinton Dix was not bad in 2019 for the Bears, but oddly enough, wasn't able to find a job last year. So I, again, I, I actually think he has a chance to be a better player than Jaquiski Tart. I just don't think we see it this year because they seem to like Tart quite a bit. Tavon Wilson, a veteran who's played slot, strong safety, free safety. He can do it all. Uh, probably makes this team, uh, offers some slot corner depth as well to K1 Williams. Tony Jefferson, they sign as well. I don't know. I, I don't know about that one. I He was not very good for the Ravens. He was he looked slower than most linebackers these days. You know, you could just put Michael Kendricks at safety instead of Tony Jefferson. He's probably faster. So I don't know about that one, but he's a smart player, good locker room guy. Moore and Harris, more younger players that I think their clock is ticking here to say the least, based on how much they're investing in other, other guys here. And then Talanoa Hufunga is an interesting pick as well. Fifth round selection there. I kind of see what they see in him, and I, I could see him being their Jaquiski Tart replacement. Again, not a good cover player. He's just not very fast, and man-to-man, -man, he doesn't have the quickness to match guys up. So you want to avoid that, and he's probably never going to be a high-end player. But a guy with really, you know, he's just always around the ball, which... When, he's around, when you get a player that is constantly deflecting balls, bringing guys down in the backfield, intercepting balls, jumping routes, it doesn't, you know, eventually it reaches a point where it's not a fluke. And I would say that he is a very high IQ player based on how often he is just around the football. So that's exciting. It's, you know, it's, it's almost Troy Palomalu-esque, which you'd never want to do when you get a guy that looks the same because he's got the same flowy hair but kind of plays like him. So interesting fifth round pick. I don't see him as a super high upside player, but hopefully he makes the team and can uh, climb his way up and maybe be the long-term replacement to Jaquiski Tart. And I'm excited to see what kind of scheme they want to do because they have a pl they, they have something what they want to do with the safety position because they have a really deep group here. I just, it's hard to say right now with the new coordinator coming in. Uh, so there's some aspects here I like. I don't think they have any huge glaring weaknesses, but... I would say the cornerback room is closer to a weakness than a strength for sure. And uh, I don't know if, if this is going to be a big asset to this team. They just hope it's not a liability, you know, just kind of do your job, keep everything in front of you and let the pass rush do the work, I think is kind of the best case scenario here. So the defense as a whole does rank 10th. You know, I'm optimistic for this pass rush. The linebackers are awesome here. It's a good run defense. And I, I do think the secondary can hold its own, although it's not a huge strength. Uh, the defensive coaching is it's just new. <laughs> it ranks 21st. I, I think you get that carryover effect that we often see, especially in good organizations like this with Robert Salah. I think him leaving, you try to do the same stuff, and most of that stuff is still going to work. It's in place. So you get the wide nine. You get the same kind of coverage systems, hopefully. Uh, I Based on the, the pieces they drafted in the secondary, and the way they've designed their front, I think that's probably the direction they want to go. But they could come out and be a cover three heavy 
three four front for all I know. So it's just schematically it's difficult to know for sure what they want to do. Uh, the home field advantage, very good out there. It was a huge part of that 2019 run was how rocking that stadium got with that pass rush up in front. So uh, they ranked 12th for the home field advantage. And then just to recap kind of some of the rest of the aspects of this team here, before we get into the schedule and my over under win total predictions for this team, special team ranks tied for 29th, kicking game solid. The coverage unit was a, a problem for this team last year. Uh, and they don't have any high-end return man at this point in time. So it's it's a fine special teams. They'll probably figure some stuff out from last year and exceed that ranking. Uh, and then the, the culture here, I am super optimistic for. I, I rank it fifth. I, I mentioned Shanahan maybe not being at the same level as some other coaches from a culture perspective, but I do think he's up there for sure. Uh, and this team has, to me, earned the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, last year their their season fell apart, but... Uh, what they were able to do in 2019 and really taking the league by storm and, and this culture and this this organization as a whole it's just very sound and everything they do makes sense and they have the right people in place so I'm very optimistic for the culture and I'm very comfortable giving this team some of the the benefit of the doubt so to speak that maybe we didn't for some other teams uh, as we get to the strengths and weaknesses here obviously offensive coaching we talked about it. You know, I think Kyle Shanahan is quietly the best coach in the NFL. Uh, the run blocking here is phenomenal. I think when you factor in Kittle and Juszczyk and the scheme, they get probably the best run blocking in the NFL. Uh, and then the highly explosive playmakers. The marriage of scheme fit and scheme and talent, it's perfect here. I mean, Debo and Ayuk, they're not the best receiver duo in the NFL but they might be about the best scheme fits that you could put into this offense, assuming you can't have a Devontae Adams or a Stephon Diggs or an A.J. Brown uh, or a Justin Jefferson. You know, that, that's about as great as you can ask for as far as elevating personnel. And then you get to the pass rush. I do think it's a, it's a great pass rush, and if Kinlaw can take that big step up in year two, it can get back to being the best pass rush in the NFL. Linebackers, of course, Fred Warner getting $20 million a year. That speaks for itself there. Uh, then the weaknesses, I do think if you can force them off script, they could show uh, to be a much worse version of themselves, uh, which you're going to say about everybody. But when you talk about a team who has an offensive line designed for run blocking and a quarterback room that, you know, depending on what you get from Trey Lance, obviously, but probably a quarterback room that isn't going to be the best outside of structure, uh, that's that's what you're going to get. Um, you also, on the defensive side of the ball, have a new defensive coordinator. Just a big moving piece there that is a question mark. And then the cornerback room, especially if Jason Verrett can't stay healthy, uh, would be a weakness. With Verrett in there, it's kind of just neutral. Not necessarily a strength, but maybe not a huge weakness. But projecting health for Jason Verrett is very difficult. But let's now wrap up with the schedule and... I shocked myself even, as high as I am on the Niners. I came out with them with 13 wins, man, which is way over their over-under of 10 wins. I will say that that's their ceiling, and that's a very optimistic projection here. And we'll see if that 13 win total holds up uh, in a few weeks here when I do my final predictions video. But uh, yeah, this, this is an optimistic outlook, but I will say this schedule is quite easy. I like that they get a lot of easier games on the road and then get some of their harder non-division games at home, which you get that home field advantage helping out that pass rush. So teams like Detroit, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, and Jacksonville all on the road. I expect them to be favored probably in all of those games except for maybe Chicago, depending on the fields factor. And then at home, you get Green Bay, you get Minnesota. So, and Indianapolis at home. So tilting the scale uh, towards San Francisco in a couple games that should be pretty close there. I have them splitting the division uh, at three and three, obviously, and spitting out a 13 and four record. Now, Vegas and the market agrees as betting the over here does not pay very well. Uh, so almost wait till that goes up to 10 and a half wins and then bet it. But I think the schedule is very favorable for a team that I'm higher on and also, I think Super Bowl bets on this team are 
intriguing. I don't think they're Super Bowl favorites or anything like that, but if a couple things go right, you know, if Kinlaw hits, uh, if Jason Verrett stays healthy, if the offensive playmakers stay healthy, and hell, if Trey Lance steps in in the second half of the season and looks incredible, there's just a couple things that need to go right, and then this becomes really a Super Bowl team. Uh, but perhaps maybe like a year away from being uh, legitimate, like high-end Super Bowl contenders, but I don't mind throwing a little money on this team for sure. I I have a lot of confidence in this team this season. So that's going to do it for this deep dive. Let me know in the comments down below, am I crazy high on this team? Is this right? Uh, And then also, please do hit that like button as well. And we'll see you guys in a few days for our next deep dive. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you later. Peace.